Washington's home on the Potomac, Mount Vernon, has been a place of pilgrimage since his lifetime. More than a million people come to Mount Vernon every year, seeking some clue to understanding the character of the distant figure at the core of the American endeavor. Washington designed Mount Vernon himself. The house and every foot of its gardens and grounds present a view of the inner man and the workings of his mind. The house is the perfect mirror of the man. It presents one puzzle after another, and it embodies a basic contradiction. Mount Vernon is not the humble abode of a Democrat, but the manor house of a colonial potentate. Washington lived privately in some grandeur and rural pomp, with a decidedly British flavor, and yet he was the man who refused to be king, who infused the ceremonies of republican government with plainness, who left a legacy of presidential modesty. Even in colonial times, the scope of a planter's ownership could surprise outsiders. As it did a Frenchman who visited a Virginia plantation and remarked, "When I reached his place, I thought I was entering a rather large village, but later was told that all of it belonged to him." Mount Vernon occupies two landscapes and straddles, as far as that is possible, two realms of time. The key to grasping the vision behind Washington's plan is the enormous view that unfolds from the piazza at the rear of the house. With the Potomac River winding to infinity and forests stretching to the horizon, a view not of the past but of the future, the future Washington envisioned for this house after he was gone was one without slavery. That is the ultimate contradiction of Mount Vernon. The place we see today, beautifully restored, is a place Washington wished to see in part dismantled. Of course, he wished that it would endure. But on a different foundation, there is a spot at Mount Vernon where one can stand today and see a revealing remnant of the system that Washington rejected. Like so much about slavery, something important was carefully concealed while standing in plain sight because it had been disguised: the majestic greenhouse that Washington designed himself. On one side, the greenhouse faces the upper garden. Where Washington liked to take guests for a stroll down paths bordered with boxwood and flower beds, then and now, someone walking through the elegant garden and admiring the majestic greenhouse would not know that the wings extending from the sides of the building, providing architectural balance and harmony, were slave barracks. The barracks opened to the rear, and on the garden side, there were no doors nor windows large enough to afford a glimpse at the interior. So when Washington's guests strolled past the greenhouse, they saw no sign that these long, handsome brick wings housed the plantation slaves. Washington had devised an architecture that rendered slavery invisible, while at the same time weaving slavery into the fabric of his grand design. It was a brilliant, chilling stroke of architectural inspiration.